How's everybody? Who said what? Okay. <laughs> just checking. Uh, I just wanted to uh, introduce you all to the process that we've gone through. As many of you know, we now uh, will be putting up the cameras, uh, speed cameras, as uh, red light cameras, as well as uh, speed cameras. Uh, just so that you all can know, the red light cameras citations are $75. Don't, don't run a red light. <laughs> and the speed camera citation, which I really thought they should be higher, that's $40. Don't you think so? But let's not, let's not speed through our city either. Um, <laughs> uh, so we have, uh, I thought that it was important that our acting department of transportation director explain along with um, the folks, Mr. Liberati, you know, how we got to this process and um, my opportunity actually to talk to other cities who engaged using these same companies, um, Chicago, Montgomery County, and the state of Delaware. And so what I asked is to be able to talk to, um, I was in Chicago, had a conversation, to see if they're working, had they had any problems. These particular cities uh, say that they're working for them. Having not been here through the last process, uh, I know I've taken quite a bit of time uh, to get to this point. Uh, people say, is it a revenue generator? Yes, it is. Uh, do we want people speeding through our streets? No. Do we want folks running red lights? Absolutely not. And so um, the first 30 days, and I just want our city residents to be aware and those who are traveling through the city of Baltimore that the first 30 days will be a trial period. Uh, you know that we've hired a company to calibrate these systems to make sure that they operate uh, consistently. And um, we want all of the questions that you all may ask to be answered. You know that uh, the cost to the city for implementing this project is about $9.5 million. Um, my understanding is that it was profitable to the city previously. And um, so I'm sure that we will gain some revenues as, as a result of this. But more importantly, I think that the citizens of Baltimore will be safer as a result of it as well. Um, we don't want folks speeding through our city. We don't want folks running red lights. And we want to protect our citizens um, at the same time as well. So why don't I let our, uh, I'm sure you all have questions. And if I can't answer them, I think I have. Looks like I got a little back up here. <laughs> President, did you want to no. say a few words? Okay, so let me let them make this presentation. Again, um, this is almost six months of going through this process and making sure that we put the proper tools in place to make this an effective, efficient process for the citizens of Baltimore. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, my name is Frank Murphy. I'm the Acting Director of Transportation for the City. This is a great day for the City of Baltimore because this gives us the tools for traffic safety, particularly on our main streets that we really haven't had since 2013 when the program was shut down. And for me personally, I was the acting director in 2013 when the, we had to shut the program down, so I'm really happy to be in that role again where we're starting up. You said um, all the answers. Exactly. <laughs> we, I can tell you from my career in traffic that the number one complaint that we get from residents about traffic is speeds. Speeds through neighborhoods, speeds on the main streets, speeds past school zones. This will give us a tool to combat that again. Uh, up until the camera programs were available, the only tool we really had was to have police officers sitting out and trying to, you know, t nab speeders. But that's a very labor-intensive effort, and of course, we need our police to do many other things too. So, when the availability of a program that could enforce speed and pay for itself at the same time, it's kind of a no-brainer for us, and we're very happy about the traffic safety benefits that this is going to provide. So, I'd like to introduce uh, one of the things that we did. I think the smartest things we did was to hire a very experienced um, manager of an ATVES program in another county, uh, PG County, and, and I'd like to introduce him to go through the rest of the details of the process that we used to get to this, this point today, and that's Rob Liberati, um, who ran the Prince George's County ATVES system. Rob? So you, Rob. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. Prince um, George's County. Um, 
I am a retired a police major from Prince George's County, Maryland, where I spent 30 years. Including, we're, we're hiring. <laughs> in, including about 10 years experience for the Fred Light and, and speed cameras. Uh, I'm joined today uh, with these uh, great people up here, but uh, there were other parts of the uh, city government that, that really helped us out, and, and I just want to recognize them. Um, the uh, Baltimore Police Department, I think Major Corbett's here, there he is, uh, great partner with us. Um, the Mayor's Office of Information Technology and Communication, I'm sorry, Mayor's Office of Information Technology, Finance and, and Legal helped out as well. And there's been other uh, parts of the city government. So this was a, a multi-agency uh, a project to get this uh, back online. Um, Baltimore, as you know, we're, we're a major city, just like Washington, Seattle, New York. We face major city problems. Um, like these cities, uh, we have traffic issues. Uh, and the challenges on our police department, on, on our uh, traffic enforcement officers are much more than, than the personnel we have. So by putting cameras out, it's a force multiplier. We can use our police officers, we can use our traffic enforcement officers for more detailed duties. Um, we've chosen two experienced camera contractors. <clears throat> they are American Traffic Solutions, uh, and I have uh, Mr. Uh, Charles uh, Trito here uh, to represent them, and he, he'll be available for questions afterwards, and Mr. Bill Tente from Conduit slash formerly known as Xerox Corporation. In addition, we have a third vendor, MRA Digital, which is a Columbia company, which is an independent lab that we've hired to do calibrations of our cameras. Um, as far as our history with cameras, I, I just want to say we understand that people are upset and frustrated by what happened in the past, and we are as well. Um, because of that, we've taken all of that information, we've taken all of the suggestions, we've taken all the comments, and we've used them to formulate this new, this new program. Changes, there's gonna be changes. Uh, the changes that I'd like to highlight are number one, fees. Our vendors are not gonna be paid um, by a split of the revenue. They're gonna be paid per camera per month. We're gonna be renting the equipment, uh, we're not gonna own anything, and they, their payment is not based on violation numbers. Number two, staffing. Baltimore City, besides me, has hired a, an ombuds person, ombuds woman, I guess you, you could say. Uh, this person is an intermedi intermediary between uh, a person who got a violation and the courts. So if someone wants to have a violation reviewed, doesn't want to take off to go to court, they can ask us to do that and we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Um, um, we also have, DOT also has four quality assurance analysts. These are civilians that will review violations uh, and they have a supervisor as well. And while I'm on that, there's gonna be dual layers of uh, violation review. So the DOT will, uh, review each violation and as well as the police department. By law, a police officer will sign on every violation that comes out. Locations. Locations will be chosen solely by the city. They will be vetted by a committee that includes traffic, which is signal, and uh, um, uh, traffic personnel towards zero deaths personnel and the Baltimore City Police Department. Uh, we will use crash data, community input, put as long, and other data that we have to help make decisions on which locations should be enforced with um, automated uh, traffic enforcement or should be recommended for other changes, striping, signage, etc. cetera. Uh, as the mayor said, there'll be a 30-day warning period before, eat, uh, before we begin to issue violations with a, a fine, um, and then thereafter, a 15-day period with every new location uh, will not be enforced for at least 15 days after advertisement and signage goes up. Camera calibration. Each camera will be calibrated by the independent lab before it's put on the street and, and each year thereafter. In addition, there'll be two daily self-checks which will be monitored by the city. 
one before speed cameras go uh, into service and one at the end of the day uh, that the camera goes off. So a speed camera is operational from 6 a.m. through 8 p.m. Monday through Friday, 52 weeks a year. We'll be uh, verifying, we'll be checking that self-test each day that the camera is operational um, um, to, to ensure that, um, that the cameras are calibrated. If they're not, any violations in that period will be voided and the camera will be turned off. Proper school zones. Uh, school zone by law is a half a mile radius of a school K to 12. That's it, K to 12. Uh, where school related activity occurs, including travel, <coughs> drop off, or pickup of a student. So it's not only within that half mile area, it's got to be a school zone where those things occur inside that half mile area. Uh, public information and outreach. Each camera contractor is providing $125,000 dedicated to public information and out outreach per year. And we direct how that's spent. That could be advertising, that could be uh, educational videos, wh whatever we see the need for. And then finally, for speed cameras, secondary speed verification. We're not only gonna have one speed calculation, but we're gonna have two that our reviewers will see and able to, uh, to verify the violation, we'll have two two speeds for the reviewers to check, which should be the same or very, very close. Um, operation of motor vehicles in violation of red lights and at speeds above the limit set by our traffic engineers are common factors in fatal injury and property damage accidents involving pedestrians and motorists alike. This behavior is a characteristic of aggressive driving or of just inattention. In addition, and we haven't talked about this yet, uh, commercial vehicle cameras. We're getting up to six commercial vehicle cameras that, that the uh, Maryland state law gives the city up to six. Um, and that's a continual complaint that we get from our citizens that their streets, that their houses are, are, are shaking and rattling because of huge vehicles that are going through residential neighborhoods. We have streets that are marked no more than three quarters of a ton truck or no commercial vehicles that may pass. And sometimes trucks are going through these routes to skip tolls or as a shortcut and it's doing damage to our streets and our homes. We're gonna be able to enforce that. That is um, a three tiered uh, fine schedule. Uh, it's a warning for the first offense, 250 for a second offense and 500 for uh, a third offense or more. Our implementation, according to our uh, RFP, was is 10 red light cameras, 10 fixed speed cameras, and 10 portable speed cameras. That's our, our goal for the implementation, and then after that, we'll be driven by uh, the need by each location. Uh, in closing, I, I just want to say this. Uh, safety is our number one priority. Baltimore City experiences over 20,000 crashes annually, in which 23% result in injury. Nearly 1,000 pedestrians are involved in crashes every year, and 25% of our children under the age of 18. On average, 31 people die from crashes each year in the city, of which pedestrians account for 40%. Even if a pedestrian is at fault, Vehicles traveling at lower speeds help give that pedestrian a chance at survival. We need to ensure that our streets are safe for walking, biking, and other modes of travel. And we know national studies have shown that speed cameras have attributed to up to 93% in reduction of crashes at locations. Baltimore City Department of Transportation is committed toward moving the city to zero traffic deaths. We encourage everyone to be safe on our streets. And the best way to avoid a ticket is to obey the speed limit, is to stop for red signals. Uh, today, as you see, we have uh, some of the equipment we'll be using. Uh, feel free afterwards to, to examine the equipment. If you have any questions, we'll have uh, technicians here to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Keep your steps, spell your last name, please. Uh, sure. Um, L I B E R A T I. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? 
When are they going to be in place? When, yeah. um, the mayor's asked us to have the cameras up by the end of the month. Uh, we're we're, we're going to do our best to do that. It'll it'll probably start with a couple of portable speed cameras, and then we'll roll out after that. But we'll make subsequent announcements as to when and where these cameras will be, and when we officially start the warning period and when it ends. Did I hear you correctly that we have to notify folks 15 days in advance? Of when those cameras are up when we have a after our original 30-day warning period whenever we move a camera to a new location we have to make sure that it's signed and advertised 15 days before we start um, operation there mm -hmm. well, we will we will have a hard and fast date because we need to make sure that the public knows a hard and fast date when the first camera appears yes can i hear you correctly that on the speed cameras they're, they don't operate 24-7? Correct. Speed cameras in, in, in most places in Maryland by law are Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. through 8 p.m., 52 weeks a year, so including holidays and summer. And that's because they're close to schools? And that's Correct. The and that, and that's, the legis that's state legislation that's mirrored in uh, city code. Now, Montgomery County was grandfathered. They have some other residential zones. Uh, Prince George's County has uh, higher education zones, but for us, that's that's how that's all we can enforce. And you said the cameras are going to be calibrated daily. Correct. There's this daily self-test, similar to when you start up your car and it goes through a check. Okay. We're going to read those checks every day, f at the beginning and the end of the day, to make sure that camera's functioning properly. One of the measurements is a speed, an internal speed check, almost like a tuning fork in front of a, a, a radar camera that measures speed and to ensure that it's accurate. Every day and make sure that it's calibrated right. And Correct. Speed is Correct. And that, that information will be logged and that's available for evidence for court. Can I ask you about the um, review by a police officer in, I think it was 2011 where this occurred, where there were thousands of citations that were signed by an officer who was dead and killed in a car accident. And so are you gonna have a live officer who oh reviews God. this on a well, I mean I mean that right. plenty of no, he means, you, are you gonna have like a real live officer that's reviewing a citation because at that time it was just a stamp rubber stamp. Um, so how's that gonna work for because there are a lot of citations to mm -hmm. Well, I think that the, the real issue wasn't the fact that it was rubber stamped. I think the issue was is that the, there was a, gl a glitch in the computer, and the officer sequence number was accidentally put on the officers who was living tickets. So it wasn't an officer just stamping them. It was an issue with the sequence number and the glitch that was in the computer. So what, how does that change now? So it changes now because, as the, as the director said, that we're going to be doing a constant update every day. I do have a sergeant who's going to be ultimately responsible for this program, and we're going to have several officers that's going to be trained, along with the time limit that each officer must stand in front of the computer or sit in front of the computer and do this. Those things have been reduced. We uh, looked at other agencies to see exactly what other agencies are doing, and we're going to copy exactly what PG County and other agencies have been doing. Is this something that means a sworn police officer, considering the, you know, shortage of sworn police officers on some patrol units, et cetera. Is this, does this program need a sworn police officer involved? Well, I think by law, by law, that the, law? it's a state law that they must have a sworn officer. And so in the past, when there were many, many speed cameras, uh, <coughs> uh, officers were reviewing something like four to six tickets per minute, right? Um, now with this much smaller program, what do you think that, do you think the officers will have more time to, to really review these things? Right yes. And, and the, in terms of the technology, this is laser technology now instead of the radars in the past where we still use the radar. Yeah, we're, uh, there's a tracking you radar. Up to the okay. We're going to be using both a tracking radar and, and a laser. So it, it depends on which piece of equipment we're using, but the idea is not you're not just sending out a cone of, of radar, you're zeroing in on a vehicle, you're following it and taking several measurements of, of the vehicle. And when you said there's going to be two verification or two, uh, this is, are those both radar or is one laser? One, one radar? I believe one's a time distance uh, okay. calculation. And it's used to, to verify that, that we're, we're dealing with the same vehicle. 
And will uh, motorists who get a ticket get um, evidence, pictures of how far they've traveled, about a time? It, it'll, they'll look similar to the other violations. The, the violation form itself is, man, is mandated by court. It's a court form. So we'll present to the court, the District Court of Maryland, what, what, uh, what our violations will look like. And they're almost identical throughout the state. So whatever that, the, the format for that is, is what our, our, our violation is going to look like. Speaking of those many, many old cameras that are still standing in the city. Good question. What is going to become of them? You too can have them. <laughs> <laughs> can we pull out on Boston? <laughs> as 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 we were as we go to the, if we go to the same locations these vendors will take them down other than that it'll be department of transportation's responsibility to remove them and and then they may be auctioned off or, or surplus okay, this is all new system with new correct all new equipment um we may use existing poles but that's it new new cameras new flashes new new control boxes etc nothing will be reused other than poles if i get a camera a can you sign it <laughs> the uh, inventory of the current number of uh, cameras you have um, in the system. Uh, your question is, do, what how is many cameras are currently in the system now, even though they're not being operated? You mean the how previous camera? The previous yeah, there's there's at least 150, and that's a ballpark I guess. Right, and they had been added on. I remember in the second contract with Gregory, you bought more cameras. Correct. Right. We've got some in a warehouse and some are on the road. So how much inventory are we talking about in terms of the cost of, of those cameras? We'll get that number too. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't put a price on it. Don't guess. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right, and those will probably be auctioned off in the future. I mean, the boxes and things we may be, be able to use for other traffic uh, control devices and things, but for the most part, they'll be auctioned. Madam Mayor, why should the people of Baltimore have confidence that this new company that was once Xerox that did not run, according to the audits, a good program. Why, why should the people of Baltimore believe Conway will do a better job? Well, let me just say it's a, unless somebody else wants to step up to the plate. <laughs> uh, let me just say that I think we've done a good job of reviewing the program. I think I've, we've done due diligence in talking with other cities to see what companies they are, are utilizing, and this company is being utilized in other cities. Uh, and uh, without complaint and let me just say I think with the calibration process and with the review that we put in place that you know I think that we will instill confidence in the citizens of Baltimore and I think that's why and then utilizing this 30-day period uh, to, to again for us to examine to make sure that we put forth the right kind of program and then uh, when as we said in this process 15-day notification of where cameras are going to uh, be placed is something that we'll do. And even before we start this program, we will give a hard, fast date. I mean, this is, you know, also about safety for the citizens of Baltimore. So uh, I would hope that they would have confidence in the process that we put forward. You know, one of the things that I, you know, continue to say that we want to make sure the government is transparent, you know, we'll be open to questions, even the review process. I think is a little bit different in the panels that will get a chance to look at this. So, you know, I'm hopeful uh, that the citizens will have confidence, and at the same time, I'm hopeful that we are running a program that'll be effective. Is, is the representative Yes. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Okay, could I uh, jump sure, in before that? Jump in. Um, just to clarify, the uh, Xerox ran our speed and red light cameras before. Uh, they're going to be doing the red light camera now, and there was never any problem with Xerox's red light operations before. That was flawless. The only problems we ever had were speed. Well, Mr. Murphy, um, the contract has um, uh, in there $625,000 to a public relations firm, uh, Sandy Hillman. What would the $625,000 be used for in this program? Well, we, as, as Rob mentioned, we're going to be meeting with both major vendors to determine what, how we want that to be used. You know, the idea, of course, is we want to make sure everybody knows the program's starting up. We want to, de you know, to get the details out, let people know about the 30-day, you know, grace period where we'll be doing so warnings. So that cost 600 plus? Well, that's over a five-year period. That's over a five-year period. Yeah. Why couldn't your in-house PR people do that? They could do it, too. Excuse me? They'll be involved as well. So there is a representative from Conduit? Yes. Yes. Would you like to step up to Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there were, I mean, what is Conduit going to do better now to 
obviously people in the city have concerns about these cameras working properly. There's been a history where they weren't working properly. What is Conduit going to do to ensure that these cameras work properly and that people can trust these cameras will put out correct results? So I think most importantly, uh, we were awarded the red light camera contract. So for us, uh, focusing on that technology is what we have to do. Uh, we're no longer using the same measurement sensors that we were uh, previously. So in this, we're using a smart radar as opposed to a radar that was more focused on the largest or the fastest vehicle. This one can pick out individual vehicles across the whole roadway. Uh, secondly, with the uh, red light focus, most importantly, we only need to see the vehicle before the stop line and then into the intersection with the light being red. So for us, speed is a component of actually identifying the red light violation occurring to know if they're going to stop before the stop line, but it's not part of issuing the violation. It's, it's kind of like the old Xerox state level solutions. Pretty much, for the most part, yes. This will be the final question. Oh, sir, can you say your name? Yeah. Say your name as well, please. Name. Uh, Bill, <laughs> B-I-L-L, -L, last name Tenty, T-E-N-T-E. What's your title? I'm the senior product manager for Conduit. As far as the calibrations and the yearly checks and the increased staff, how much is that of that is actually different from 2013? The second, um, first of all, we have an independent company. Before that, uh, the, the company that did calibrations was paid for by the by the speed camera company, which was Xerox at the time. In addition, we added a second daily check. Uh, there was only one before. And, and I neglected to mention this, but when we put a camera down on the street, we are going to test it ourselves by running police vehicles by at certain speeds just to verify at the time we, we put the camera out that it's, uh, it's operating correctly. Okay, thank you. We're going to ask everyone if you will step into this room over here. The mayor will stay right here. Just to come in. <coughs> Guys, we have five minutes for you to ask <coughs> any additional questions. The mayor has to be out front. And I hope you'll join us for the uh, Heart Association um, and Hypertension Bus Up. And I'm, I'm not getting my blood pressure. <laughs> <laughs> but I announced the that. The administrative results of the investigation of the officers in the pretty great case are completed. Yes. And then it turned over to the APD, and it's now everybody's waiting to know what's the public going to know, if anything, and when's it going to know. How can you answer that question? Well, I don't have an answer for that question, Jane, but I will have a conversation uh, with the police commissioner about what will the public get to know as it relates to these investigations and the outcomes. As you well know, this was an independent investigation, and so I'll, I'll have that conversation. I'll be able to share what I get from that conversation with you following that. Madam Mayor, Jesus Penaza is the man who was arrested or detained by ICE outside of Hampstead Hill Academy over in Southeast. He has a trial hearing on June 1st. Um, and that will determine whether or not he gets deported from the U.S. Um, he's, he's right now in Frederick's holding cell. Where? Uh, I'm sorry? You said he's where? Frederick's, uh, Fred, sorry, Frederick's Frederick Frederick County. County. Frederick County, thank you. No, Howard County, it's in Howard County, I'm sorry. Right, let's go. Um, so uh, the question is, are you doing, is your office, I know you don't have any authority over a federal judge, but is your office gonna write a letter at all to a federal judge just stating what, what your thoughts are on, you know, immigration in the city and anything related to that? I, know I think have, we've made public statements on immigration and, you know, I'm not in the habit of writing letters. And um, let me just say, I first of all, it's the first I've heard of that. And, you know, I'm on top of a lot of things, but that one I'm not on top of. With, with Pimlico and, and Redmond and Pimlico and using taxpayer dollars, do you get the sense that the company that owns Pimlico is trying to shake down the city or state? Well, let's that. hope not. Um, <laughs> let's, let's, let's hope not. Uh, um, but I did hear that the governor said that he was interested in supporting uh, the renovation and keep, well, what he said was keeping the Preakness in Baltimore. And I think that's important. I mean, every city doesn't get to have its own Super Bowl every year. That's what the Preakness <coughs> means to Baltimore City in terms of economic impact and economic generation. But I do think that fixing up Pimlico will also generate more interest and support for the uh, Park Heights community, the Rice's Town Road corridor, even that Northern Parkway corridor. It's easily accessible. You know, I mean, there are a lot of things that we could do with Pimlico uh, in terms of maybe a public-private partnership. You know, there's nowhere in the city 
that a thousand people can come to and park for free, uh, whether it's a catered event or a wedding or a reunion or whatever. Um, I think this offers a great opportunity to look at how to, you know, what that investment should look like, and whether it is public or private do uh, dollars. I believe that we need to save the Preakness and keep it in Baltimore. Should the owners help contribute? Oh, absolutely. I think so. I do. Madam Mayor, I know you're heading out to uh, Vegas this weekend for the uh, big real estate conference. Do you have any particular goals? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I'm also speaking there, uh, and I'll be speaking to a group of retailers about the needs of Baltimore. Uh, as you well know, we're still a food desert, not enough, um, uh, not enough grocery stores in the city. <coughs> Certainly, uh, retail is growing in certain parts of the city and not in others. Um, I'm also looking at quarters of the city. Um, I have specific asks around movie theaters, bowling alleys. I don't know if we'll be able to get those things, but I do think the city deserves them. And so we've got a whole presentation before a group of um, retailers about what we think the city's needs might be. So one question about the budget, because the budget during the tax payers tonight. Um, the council members yesterday were talking about how we're lumping in youth, the $12 million in youth funding with the I believe it's 400 million, correct me if I'm wrong, in education funding into the same thing to say that we're spending more on youth than police. Why are they lumped together? Well, let me just be real clear, and I don't think maybe you don't understand how the city schools, for example, are funded. Unlike Baltimore County, unlike Montgomery County, unlike Prince George's County, you know, all of us pay taxes, and normally the money comes directly to those jurisdictions. In 1997, the city's um, school budget got separated from the state's state, and so unlike every other jurisdiction like Baltimore County, their money comes directly to the school um, to the county, and then gets sent to the school system in Baltimore City because of the problems and the $500 million that was requested in 1997, our money does not come directly to the city. It goes directly to the schools. So the schools get a billion dollars. We add another $400 million to that, which makes their operating budget $1.4 billion, while the city's operating budget is $2.8 billion, which we pick up trash, uh, maintain our parks, and all of the other things that the city has to do. And so, um, in fact, if you look at what we spend per pupil, per student, I think it's around, um, the numbers are pretty good. And so we have a structural deficit in our school system that we're working to fix. I, I'm talking with our CEO of the school system almost every day and working with the state. We're working for, we're waiting for the current report to come out so that we can increase funding for our school system. So we look forward to that. We only have a few minutes left. Yes. And, and the park makes an <coughs> There, one, one of the um, visions is to add on a, a shopping center retail onto Pimlico. Mm -hmm. um, do, do you embrace that, and, and will the city put any funding towards that? Well, let me just say, I think that Pimlico offers a, a lot of possibilities, retail being one. Um, I was going to say unfortunately, but fortunately, I'm old enough to remember Pimlico Racetrack when uh, the big restaurant was there and everybody went there. Retail was a little bit more robust in that neighborhood, but there's still a lot of things lacking. You could see where um, Sinai Hospital is investing in that area, just broke ground for a 99 unit uh, facility for seniors, uh, senior living community there. Um, expanding, you saw the new uh, center where you can get emergency care right there on that campus. I just think it's a great community to invest in. And so whether it is adding additional retail, especially along that Belvedere Carter, you know, a great opportunity for a shopping center and retail establishments that will make a difference in that community. And I, as I said um, earlier, one of the things that we're doing, because that area does get slots impact money, so we're focusing that slots impact money uh, this year, 80, 80 to 85 percent of the money is going to be focused on that Park Heights corridor. Uh, 141 boarded up houses there that we're going to be doing some renovation, offering incentives for people to move into that area, and offering incentives for developers using that money uh, to be able to rehab those houses. Have you had conversations with the, with the I Jockey Club? I, I've had yeah. conversations with the, the vice president of, is it a Stromager uh, group? Stromager. How, how you say it? Strong. Do you think Strong it, I mean, what, what do you think the possibility is that they'll, that they'll try to do this? Oh, I, I, I don't, I think that um, when I met with the vice president of the company, they too feel that it's the Preakness should stay in Baltimore. 
Um, and we talked about if we were to engage in an MOU around the rehabbing of Pimlico, and, and what they said to me is that for the 300, 350 million dollars, we might as well tear it down and build a new facility, and that they would be willing to engage in an MOU to make sure that the Preakness stays in Baltimore. Because right, right now we have, um, sorry, last one. Go ahead. Uh, it's only been used two weeks a year. Right, and that's why I talk <laughs> about. <laughs> well, but that's but that's why but that's why I talk about you know creating a facility that we can use year round there, and maybe perhaps doing that we can attract more racing days back to Baltimore. Thank you. I'd love to do that. No, it is. Oh, I mean, yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, correct. No, I thought you were talking about my training. I do get up in the morning at 5 a.m. <laughs> Thank you.